So I'm going to do a really quick intro on myself. Uh, OK. And it's not working. What'd you do? There we go. All right, so this is my day job. Um, I look like this, too. <laughs> yeah, when I put my hair up, this is what happens. I turn into a, a, a white teacher. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've been, I, I used to teach in the New York City public schools uh, system, and it was actually incredibly frustrating because you realize how little you can really get done being a teacher. And most of this is going to be focused on math education um, because that's, for one reason, um, because that's, I feel, where we're lacking the most as a country. Um, we're far behind a lot of European and especially Asian countries in mathematics. And now with um, you know, increasing technology, computer science, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, you know, I think Einstein was probably the last true theoretical physicist. So now a lot of physics has to do with mathematics. So the fact that we're behind means that we're going to be, be technologically behind. So this is a big problem, unless we fix it. Oh, yeah. So this is, um, <laughs> I have taught the kids this little, and I've also taught grown-ups this old, um, because I do work with teachers as well. And I work for this guy um, at the University of Chicago. He actually does have an eye patch and a peg leg, and he used to be a badass and broke into cars before he like, lost the ability to walk on his own. So, yeah. All right, so a little bit about hackers and why I'm here talking about education. Because I think the way that hackers approach learning things is really interesting. Because you look at something, like any tool, right? And then we like to break it up into all of its component pieces, look at it, examine it, and then build it back into something bigger, <laughs> right? <laughs> So yeah, um, in the outside world, the way education is approached is that it's some serious business. And <laughs> it's really not associated with fun, which is kind of a shame. So you know, this is the typical classroom. All my kids kind of look like that sometimes. Um, but we have to look at education from you know, all sorts of perspectives. The fact that we see people dancing, we don't think that they're learning from the motion of their bodies or when we're gardening, that we're not learning from nature. The fact that you know, learning how to make a plant grow is a huge process. Um, when we interact with people, when we talk to people of different cultures, the amounts that we learn from them. I went to a public school, and I think one of my biggest education um, there, considering that I learned nothing in the classroom, really, because it was New York City Public Schools, but um, one of my biggest education processes was uh, going to around and talking to different people from different parts of the world. I went to school in Queens, so that was a highly ethnic population. It was pretty neat. So I have friends from all over the world. Um, the fact that we see sports as something that's like a brute force thing, the fact that we don't see playing a game, learning the rules, learning to cooperate and interact with other people, um, that's also a form of education. <coughs> When we build something with our hands, learn how each of its component pieces work, that's learning. When we sit down and read a book for the sheer joy of reading a book without having a test that follows, that's learning. Um, when we sit down and try and analyze a problem and logically work through it, that's also learning. By the way, this kid has a mistake on the board. Can everyone see it? I'm testing you guys now. Do you guys see it? Where is my mouse? Where is this? On the, on 3,768 times 32, that should be, if you times 2 is 16, create a 1, you've got a, you've got a 2 up there. Don't I don't know if that's 2 from carry the 1 from 2 times 6, or if it's a 2 from carry the 2 from 3 times 8 is 24, 3 times 16 is 18 plus 2 is 20. I don't know. I'm going to give him that. There's a really big mistake over here. The, reason, the fact that he's multiplying 32 times 32 times 32 times 32 is a problem for me. Do you guys see it? Yeah, yeah. Four times h to the fourth is not 32. Yeah. Yup. This is a problem that I like go uh, like you know head to tail toes with with like like kids. Um, yeah. The fact that this even shows up as like something that's a really good job for a kid that bothers me. Um, that we just don't look at this and intuitively think, wow, there's a problem there. All right. Well, anyway. Multiple intelligences. <laughs> um, so 
Howard Gardner had this theory that um, we have eight different intelligences. I think that's, again, condensing it down. I think he's trying to generalize. Um, but I think the, the part that I take away from this is that there are multiple intelligences, that everything we do, every experience we have is a learning process. And the fact that we don't recognize it as such is a problem. Okay, um, now all of these intelligences are encompassed, supposedly, in the Scantron sheet. We fill in these bubbles, and it's supposed to judge how smart we are, how successful we'll be in life, what college we go to, um, what we'll become, how we're looked upon. So yeah, um, the problem with tests. I think this is a right answer. The question asks, find x. And the kid found it, right? I think I saw someone wearing this as a t-shirt once, which is kind of neat. Yeah, this is a correct answer. Solve the question completely, right? If you're going to ask, solve for the value of x in this right triangle, then you should have said that, right? But we're so trained to look for the calculations. You know, I would have given kid credit for this. I think it's pretty neat. All right. Back in the old days, this was considered a class, shop class. I've worked at a number of schools. I don't think this exists anymore because we're taking tools away from kids saying that they're not able to play with dangerous tools. It's not safe because we're too stupid to work with them and not chop off our own heads. This used to be in every high school too, home ec class. I don't see that in high schools anymore because fire is a dangerous thing. Um, people are considering there are certain school boards we're talking about taking away Bunsen burners from chemistry class because Bunsen burners are hot and chemicals are dangerous, and we shouldn't allow kids and dangerous things to mix, ever. God forbid they learn something from the experience. Um, now I take a look at art classes and music classes, and these things are slowly being disintegrated from the typical curriculum. People don't take it seriously anymore. These are the uh, trivial classes from which all of my students are taken to learn more math and history and reading. Not to say math and history and reading aren't important, but so are the arts, and it's slowly disintegrating as a program in schools. Um, so, <sighs> I don't know. This is what's going to eventually happen to all of our kids. Um, how do you get these fingers op apart? All right, so here's some facts. They're very math focused. Um, so according to the National Center for Education Statistics in 2009, this is how US students compare to other students in the world. In the beginning, we seem to be doing pretty on par on average in the fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way up through middle school, the end of eighth grade. Um, students on these uh, international math exams are performing about on average, slightly above even. And then they hit high school um, where you start learning more conceptual mathematics, things like algebra and geometry, um, things that take more than one step to solve and suddenly it becomes uh, apparent that we haven't really trained ourselves as a country uh, to compete on an international level. So 15-year-olds um, were significantly below the average. In fact, they were in the bottom quartile. Um, and in every single grade level, um, regardless of it being like first or eighth grade or 10th grade, uh, China, Japan, Korea, Singapore beat us every step of the way. See a similarity there? These are all Asian countries, right? So um, it's, kind of, it's kind of frightening to me. I moved to this country with my family because this place is way more kick-ass than China. Um, and the, China has this mission that it's going to sort of conquer the world with finance. And it's on its way to do that because its future their kids are so much better at mathematics than we are, and finance, if nothing else, has to do with math. Um, so that worries me. Um, so this is this was a really interesting read. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. This is called Knowing Teaching Elementary Mathematics by Li Ping Ma. Uh, she went and compared a group of teachers in China and the US of all levels, starting from uh, first year and second year teachers uh, to very experienced teachers, teachers who've been in the classroom for over 20 years. Um, and these are some of the things I want to talk about that I thought was really interesting. Um, she looked first at really basic elementary mathematics. And why I find this really compelling is, you know, it's one of those very, um, very standardized and statistic statistical evidence-based studies that talks about something that a lot of people have, sus have suspected all along. The reason 
um, U.S. kids aren't good at difficult, comp uh, comprehensive level um, mathematics, things like algebra and geometry, is because we fail to teach them those skills in arithmetic. And how does arithmetic even equate to things like algebra and geometry? Um, well, we look at something like regrouping for subtraction. This is the way it's taught in the U.S. where we just say, well, um, how many of you guys have heard of this? Well, you say 56 minus 9. I first look at 6 minus 9, and I can't do it because I can't take away 9 from 6. So I borrow 1 from the 5, so it's left with 4, and that 1 gets moved to the 6, but it becomes a 10, and all of a sudden I have 16. 16 minus 9 is 7, and 4 minus nothing is 4. How many of you guys were taught that way in school? A lot of you, right? Yeah. Um, I actually thought this was fascinating. This is the way they think about it in China. There are many ways. There's this idea of multiple regrouping, that a number itself can be broken up into different component parts. So we can look at 56 minus 9, and I say, well, I need more than 6 to take away 9, so why don't I look at this? 16 take away 9 is 7, and I know I have 40 left, so it's 47. Right? Another way to think about it, break it all up into parts. I take a larger part. I know 10 can subtract any single digit number, so I look at 10, subtract 9, I get 1, and I add it over to the 40 and the 6. Um, this kind of regrouping, where I say, all right, it takes, if I take away the 6, I still have 3 left to take away, so I take that 3 away from the 50 that's remaining, and that gives me 50 minus 3, which is a lot more straightforward to calculate than 56 minus 9, right? So what does this mean going on in the future? It means the students who learn multiple regrouping have a better idea of place value, have a better idea of algebraic property, the use of parentheses and where they fall, um, the use of the order of operations. Like that kid who made a mistake in the exponents problem, he didn't understand the order of operations. Playing around with regrouping gives them a better sense of order of operations, and that applies straightforwardly to um, variables. All right, fractions. What's the answer? One and three fourths divided by a half. I heard it. Three and a half, yeah. Don't turn it into a decimal, guys, because we're working with fractions here. Yeah, three and a half. So um, there was a survey for 23 US teachers. Can you guys guess how many got these, this question right? <laughs> a little less than 50%, actually. Yeah, better, better than three. Um, of 23 US teachers survey, 43% got the correct answer. Um, so correct being three and a half, fully reduced in the same, um, I think, Seven halves might have counted as well. 14 over two, 4 did not count uh, because they didn't reduce. 19% weren't sure what procedure to take. They were kind of confused. And they got lost in, oh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to divide or multiply or there's something with a flipping. 24% were confused by the fragmentary rules that they barely understood or remembered from their own education. These are elementary school teachers. In an elementary school, you're supposed to be able to teach your kids fractions. Um, and the remaining two didn't attempt to try. Um, they looked at the problem and said, I can't do it. Um, 72 Chinese teachers surveyed. And remember, this is all the way ranging from first year teachers to teachers who've been in the classroom for 30 years or more. 100% solved it correctly. Um, the next question they were asked was actually to put the problem in terms of a real world situation. <coughs> So can you make a word problem where dividing by two, what, dividing by half makes sense? Does anyone, can anyone guess what happened then? Some of them could. But a lot of people got confused um, with the idea of dividing by two and dividing by a half and multiplying by a half. So that, that got really confused with everyone. And I actually see that with my work with elementary school teachers all the time, that when I say, dividing by a half, they immediately in their head think, dividing by two? No, dividing by a half. That means you put into groups of a half, not groups of two. It's a very different problem. So of the 23 teachers surveyed, one person was able to get it into a word problem. And it wasn't a word problem that actually made sense in the real world. Um, I think she said something like, one and three fourths divided, one and three fourths cookies, um, if each kid gets a cookie, how many kids get cookies? And her answer was three and a half kids. 
And she was like, well, I guess the half a kid doesn't really make sense. Um, but she could have, actually, I think uh, she was close, because if she could have changed the question to, um, I want to make packages of cookies. Um, how many packages can I make? Three and a half packages does make sense, right? Because you have a quarter cookie that only makes half a package of cookies. Yeah. Um, of the 72 Chinese teachers, 90% of them were able to make an appropriate word problem um, that was real world, that did apply. And uh, I think 2%, yes, 2% of them were also confused and not able to do a problem that related to the real world. But very close to all. All right, so the question is, whose fault is it? He's pointing at you. Is it yours? Yes. Maybe. OK. Um, currently, the consensus is teachers. It's my fault, because I'm a teacher. Yeah. Um, and there have, all these, there have been all these punishments, in a way, placed in for teachers. We're not trying hard enough, you know. Um, I think <coughs> Teach for America, have you guys heard of that program? Yeah, Teach for America tries to source from the smartest teachers, the smartest people in the country, and make them teachers with no preparation, because, you know, they're just that awesome. They don't need preparation. And what they're showing is, statistically, these teachers are performing, on average, slightly better than the experienced teachers that are already out there. And I say, pshaw, because if you're taking the smartest people that you have found in this country and putting them in the poorest, worst educated neighborhoods, where the teachers are the poorest and worst educated teachers, and they're doing marginally better, that means that you're really, really messing up somewhere. They should be doing exceptionally better. Because on test scores, on performance, on the amount of salary that they will potentially make, they're exceeding these people by far. So why is it that they're only barely teaching these students a little bit better? Um, and the idea is, well, maybe it's because you're not trying enough. Maybe if we equated your salaries with how well kids are doing on tests, because tests we found are so accurate for measuring our success levels. Um, the unfortunate thing is, not a lot of people look at teachers and say, how do we help them become better teachers? How do we teach them better? How do we support them better? Um, in New York, there's this infamous rubber room where teachers go to if they get in trouble. So um, you know, if they yell at a student at a bad time, they're deemed inappropriate, uh, unqualified. They go sit in a rubber room where they're paid a full salary because they're unionized. Um, and they do nothing. Um, principals have actually used this as an excuse to get rid of teachers that are, are paid higher. So, you know, if you've been in the system for 20 years and you're getting paid $80,000, they can make up some excuse to get you into the rubber room and hire someone else for $40,000. Um, and they do the same job for less. So that, that works out great for the city. This was another big um, claim. A while back, we said it was the parents. If the families cared, then all of the kids would care, right? Um, so it must be the parents' faults. Maybe we should train parents to make sure they, they're qualified to be parents first. Maybe we should put them in a testing environment. And then, you know, if you pass the test, then you can get pregnant. Oh, if only it worked that way. But, um, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, now there are actually programs out there that look at the holistic approach of helping out families. Again, it's a matter of not blaming, but supporting. Um, the Harlem Children's Zone in New York inspired Obama to take, uh, I think, what was it, uh, $250 million out of the federal budget. And he, want, he dispersed that in $25 million increments to 10 different programs that were called Promise Communities across America. And the whole point of these Promise Communities is not to blame the families, but to actually put out resources to help families to support these students better. Because a family who has never seen college themselves, who doesn't know what a professional job or a professional environment looks like, isn't able to um, bring their kids up to that level. So look that up. All right. And the other big popular theory was the kids. So if we're helping the families and we're helping the teachers and that's not really doing anything, then it must be the kids' fault, those evil little brats. Thank goodness we've got jails. <laughs> um, it's actually shocking how high the um, 
prison rates are for America, uh, especially for um, black males. Um, the percentage of black males in inner city schools who end up in matriculating from college is 4%, and the percentage of black males who matriculate out of jail is over 50 in inner city schools. Yeah, so it's pretty scary statistic, yeah? Oh, so that means they actually complete college. Yeah, and I, it was, I, was, I was joking when I said they matriculate from jail. I mean, they complete a prison sentence. So as in a lot of... No, that was, that was me just being sarcastic. Well, Most they, of them, they can take, take a degree. Um, a lot of them don't, yeah. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of black males in cities end up in prison, and very few of them end up on any path to success. And I think it's just we're cycling this blame game, right? And then eventually go, well, it's the politician's fault because they keep on making false promises and not giving us any kind of support um, ultimately, the cycle, it cycles back. We can just keep on blaming each other forever and ever and ever. And then we think, oh my god, maybe it is you. Could it be me? Um, the fact is, it's all of us. Um, and I think all of us have a responsibility to our collective communities um, to make an impact in education, especially here where everyone's so bright and everyone's got some kind of ingenious idea up their sleeve. Um, so here are some projects um, for education. So um, tutoring a student. Here are some programs that I work with that tutor students. Um, well, actually, the first one is for tutoring teachers. This is all out of Chicago, because I'm from Chicago. And a lot of these programs are out of the University of Chicago. Um, this one is a program that works with um, inner city public school teachers, um, teaching them higher level mathematics. And the question, I get this question a lot. Why am I learning this? I'm just a third grade teacher. I don't ever need to teach this. Why am I learning this? I teach the retard kids. Um, they would never need to learn this. But the fact of the matter is, they absolutely need to learn this. There's no such thing, I think, as a retard kid. I think it's because the system um, tells them tell certain students that they're not able to make it. I'm so sick of getting in really, really exceptional children who have had previous teachers tell them, you're just not good at math. Um, and the thing is, they actually become my best math students because all these years of being told you're not good at math makes them a lot more creative and makes them better at math um, when they actually start thinking about it. Um, so it's about training teachers to think on a broader scale so that in teaching arithmetic, you're also teaching higher level mathematics and higher level logic. The Young Scholars Program takes really bright kids um, from across Chicago, and we teach them things like knot theory and uh, theoretical economics. Um, the Collegiate Scholars Program takes kids from really shitty schools, and we teach them a lot of really good math. So what ends up happening in this program is um, this is this is a was a, an eye opener for me as to how the average Chicago public school looked, because um, the highest performing students in that school get recommended to this program and we receive them and they say yeah 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 I know everything like I'm a straight A student at the school I'm like yeah I'm really on top of my shit and we open it up with some basic algebra and these are ninth grade students so they've all taken algebra before. And they're shocked because they don't know what they're doing. Oh, no, go back. There we go. Um, so we're trying to get them college ready. That's it. Did you have a question? What were they doing? Are you talking about the algebra? <coughs> they knew some algebra. They knew like x plus 2 equals 5. You're supposed to subtract 2 from each side because that's the opposite operation. They knew how to solve several multi-step equations. They had never seen um, a quadratic before. They had no idea how the relationship between a line related to an equation. Like x equals y, very basic equation. Like if you have two variables and they have a direct positive correlation to each other. They didn't understand how that graph related to that equation or how the numbers, if I did a statistical analysis and I had a regression um, and all the dots you know, looked very close to that best fit line, what did that mean? So a lot of the stuff they hadn't learned. So I'm sorry, what's your question? Well, I, I had a 
build off of her question. I think what she was asking is how did these kids think that they had, they, they knew what they were doing was correct and that they, they were told that they met the standard. And I think it's the school district to a point, the area and the community, they were told they had met standards so they were being, they were allowed to be moved along. And, but whenever they went to your program where you tested them, they didn't meet national standards. They just met their local school district said, hey, yeah, you know what you're doing. You can move on now. Unfortunately, our national standards aren't particularly high either. I know it's been a really long time since like any of us have taken the SATs. Um, and tutoring for the SATs is actually pretty surprising. The SATs focus is almost exclusively on very basic algebra. So once you finish ninth grade algebra, truly finished ninth grade algebra, you're set to get an 800 on the SAT math, um, which means everything you learn after that is kind of hogwash. Um, all right, Teen Living Programs is another program that I work with. It's with um, homeless youth um, who are sort of just, you know, they're, they're cast out. They really don't know what, uh, what to do. And it's a program um, that pushes them to get their GEDs and get good jobs and stay out of jail. So um, yeah, as many people get off the street as possible. So all right, I want to talk a little bit about 826 Valencia, because that's really popular. Um, have any of you guys heard of this? I think, I, I, I'm surprised actually, because I've known a lot of people who heard of this. Uh, David Eggers, um, the guy who wrote like a brilliant, staggering work of genius or whatever, too many words. Um, but he's a, a famous author, and he realized while he was hanging out in San Francisco that a lot of his friends were really smart and were kind of like eh, on the fringe, kind of doing some side freelance work, not really trying to write their next big novel at home. Um, they had a lot of free time. They wanted to be able to help kids, but they weren't able to um, find the right means by which to do so. So he started this thing called 826 Valencia, um, which is housed, it's a tutoring program housed in a pirate shop. So kids go in, they play the high pirate shop, um, they get some cool toys, and then they go to the back room and they get help with their homework. And volunteers volunteer whenever they have time, um, whenever works for them. They come in, they just work with these kids. And now it's spread all over the country. There's um, a, a spy shop in Chicago, and there is a superhero store in New York. Yeah, so there's a robot store in Ann Arbor. Yay, thank you. Bigfoot Searching Lab in Boston. OK, yeah, there, there are a lot of those. I think it's just really, the model is adorable just because the store sells really cute, kitschy things. And the kids go in, and they get tutoring. Um, unfortunately, what I found is that places like this um, tend to have a lot of tutors lined up, especially in New York. It was shocking that they had a wait list for tutors. There were so many people who had signed up. And in New York City, I know there are tons of programs that are underfunded and that don't have enough volunteers. Um, and I think you know it, it, it takes a little bit more research to find the programs that aren't as um, highly advertised by a famous celebrity type person as 826 Valencia. Um, I think this is a great program, but there are other programs that also need people to just come in whenever they have a free moment um, to work out with the work with a kid. Yes. Do I have a list? Um, no, I don't. Usually, if I'm like like teen living programs, I just sort of stumbled across it. Um, I think it's just keeping your eyes and ears open. I I look for it. Like sometimes I find it online. I went to the um, what helped me in New York. I went to the A two six Valencia store there, and I said, you know, if there's a wait list for this program, do you know of any others? And they directed me to some some numbers that I could call. Um, yeah, just asking around. There's so many places that are in high need and high demand. So. Yeah. Um, if you want to become a teacher, this is the best teaching program I've seen in the Midwest. It's the Urban Teacher Education Program. Um, it requires a lot. Um, it requires that you have either a math degree undergraduate or um, have taken a lot of um, pure mathematics courses. Um, and this is a, a five-year program. In the first year, you take a lot of um, high-level math courses, abstract algebra, analysis in um, art in the end dimensions. Um, and then the second year is all about pedagogy. How do you approach the classroom? It's about practice teaching, different methods. Um, probably the best coursework that I've seen on kinesthetic activities. By kinesthetic, I mean bodily and um, you know, logical and like moving to do, to do work. So um, 
I think it's a very nice program. And then for the next three years, there's mentorship um, along with your teaching. Yes. How would you compare that to the NTE? The NTE? National What's the NTE? National Teacher Exam. Oh, the National Teacher Exam. Um, gosh, I don't even think I've taken the National Teacher Exam. I think I took a bunch of teacher exams in New York, and I think a lot of states have different testing. Um, I'm pretty, God, I'm pretty sure even Chicago doesn't require you to take the NTE. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, here's what I think about teaching, teacher testing in general. Um, they're testing for, for a couple of things. One, that you know how to read. Uh, two, that you know how to write. And three, that you know how to fill in bubbles. Like, I, I mean, <laughs> the, the math I took, in, in New York, they actually have one of the highest uh, standards for teaching. So for high school math teachers, you had to take the high school level math exam. Um, and it was, it was really cute. They like had all these questions in different subject areas. And the last question was the really hard one. It was worth a lot of points. And um, if you got every, but the thing is, if you got every single question on the test right and you skipped that question, you still would have passed. Uh, but that question was the calculus question. And um, I really didn't know how to do it because it wasn't really a calculus question. It was a how to plug in things to your TI-83 question. So you had to have a TI-83, and they asked you, like, what does the YX window read? I was like, what are they talking about? And then someone gave me an instructional video and showed me how to get to that window, and it had all of these, like, values that showed you how wide the screen was, what each of those increments meant. They wanted that on the test. That was part of your testing to see that you understood. Um, one of the questions was, plug this into your graphing calculator. What picture do you have? Can you sketch it on here? None of that tested calculus whatsoever, and yet they claimed that it was a calculus question because it was a maximizing volume question. And lo and behold, I saw the tutorial. I figured out how to do it on my TI-83 calculator. I brought it into the test, and guess what question was on the test? The exact same one that they reuse every single year. Because, you know, God forbid they actually test mathematics. Um, these tests are sort of like, you know, you, you have to show that you're trying to get them. And I think in general, um, those tests are really poor. I've heard across the board from, from teachers who are good teachers, you know, you take the test because you have to take the test. Um, and that helps you become a teacher. I don't think the t tests are really rigorous enough. I think a true program doesn't care about testing. It cares about actually teaching you how to approach a subject um, matter to different kids of different levels. Um, and this is something that UTEP does, the Urban Teaching Education Program. And it's focused primarily on math and science at the elementary and high school levels. Um, so it's the most rigorous program that I've seen, um, both in contact level, in pedagogy level, in practice, um, and in support. Um, this one, Math for America, this I put up here because it's the best paying program. Um, so this is actually, I think it's a, it's a big social experiment because there is one guy who donated billions and billions of dollars to math education, started in Math for America in New York City. Uh, what they do is they give you a stipend of $30,000 and send you off to a really good master's program. You spend that year chilling out, learning how to teach. And then you're dedicating the next four years of your life to teaching. You find a job in a public school, and they give you um, $70,000 over the course of that four years on top of your salary as a teacher. So what that's saying is, yeah, we know that you could have been a math and science teacher. Uh, you could have done something in math and science and earned $80,000 a year easily. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you become teachers and still give you that amount of salary. Um, my question for them is, what happens after those first four years of teaching? Does everyone quit because they can get paid more somewhere else? I don't know. It worries me. Um, but now they, they've got programs everywhere. Uh, they've got three in the West Coast, um, in Berkeley, UCLA, and in San Diego. Um, they've got in New York, in Boston, in Washington, D.C. Um, and they're trying to spread everywhere. So I'm curious to see if this actually works in the long term for um, teachers of mathematics. But look it up if you are interested in becoming a math teacher or a science teacher. Um, this is a really great program to give you lots of money. All right. For people who have families, um, places like 
Maker Fairs. I love Maker Fairs. Those are so fun. You see little kids come, like they build things and they discover things. Um, this is a picture of Architac performing at the World Maker Fair. Do you guys see Architac on uh, America's Got Talent? They're these dudes who dress up in like iron suits and uh, make music with these giant Tesla coils that pump electricity into the air. It's a really cool experience. Like you like actually you really feel the music. And it sounds really like staticky and poppy just because of the quality of the electricity. So um, and then the nice thing about them is they're not just about a show. Between every single performance, they talk about, do you know what a Tesla coil is? Um, do you know what it does? Do you know how electricity is generated? Do you know what lightning is? You know, the speed of light and the speed of sound and you know how music is made. Um, so that was, that was just a really neat thing to watch. But um, if you've never gone to a maker fair and you're local to Midwest, um, there's one in Detroit. So look that up, Maker Fair Detroit. You should definitely go. The biggest one is in the Bay Area that's coming up in May. So that's very soon. Um, definitely check it out. All right, um, this is something that's starting. The Museum of Math, the first math museum, the, sorry, the first museum dedicated to math, um, they started out as a traveling math show for kids. Um, and they're starting a physical museum in New York City in the next two years, I'd say. Um, so that's their timeline. Check them out. Um, theme Camp. Um, and also a curious summer. I don't know if that's still running. But um, anyway, Theme Camp, look that up. Um, this is a bunch of kids getting together in the woods in New Hampshire to do one solid project over the course of four weeks. They learn how to do carpentry, and they build their own wood cabins. Um, they learn to make movies, and they build, like last year, their big project was they built a whole blue screen, an entire set, um, and they made a 17-minute movie about traveling to the sun. Um, and they use a lot of really neat, like, techie tricks. So, you know, a bunch of kids from like, you know, uh, 7 to 16 um, just working with dangerous tools and getting their hands dirty and learning how to make something really cool happen. Um, the Tinkering School Chicago. So this was something that started in San Francisco, but this was the first year it was supposed to move to Chicago. Unfortunately, after a lot of work with these guys, they lost their space for an overnight camp. Um, so if any of you guys are planning to be in Chicago for the summer, um, like let me know. I'll get you in contact with the lead person in this um, because we really need some help getting a day camp running. A lot of parents are saying, I really want this to happen. I will make anything, like I will do anything to make this happen. And it's such a rewarding experience. This is about teaching kids how to sharpen knives, how to use a blowtorch, how to weld, how to solder. Um, you know how to cut things and break things and make things. It's about like a one-week program teaching them how to build and how to break and how to remake. Um, it was founded by Gaver Tully, who wrote this book called um, 100 Dangerous Things You Should Definitely Let, let Your Kids Do. Um, so this whole camp is about that theme. So please, if, you, if you're interested, let me know, because we definitely need um, volunteers for that one. Not volunteers. You do get paid for that one. All right, um, Brightworks. Brightworks is a school that is starting by Gaver Tully of um, what I just said, the Tinkering School before, and um, Brian Welsh of A Curious Summer. So they're getting together um, to start a K through 12 school that's focused on, I'm really curious to see how this school starts. They're starting um, very ambitiously this September. So they're talking about getting kids into six week cycles. It's very much like a camp aspect. In those six weeks, they'll bring in experts in something like wind, and they'll talk about you know, all sorts of wind projects, how wind affects flight. You know, they'll say, how do we build a kite that has the, the best speed and height? Um, they'll build projects. They'll folk, every kid will choose a project. They'll focus on that. They'll research. They'll build something. They'll experiment. And then finally, in the last two weeks, they write a paper on it. And this is for um, you know, third graders. So a third grader has to write a research paper, and that's how they start their exploration. And when that six week is over, the next week they, just, uh, the next week they start water. And they bring in experts on water and water treatment facilities, and kids do something like that. I'm really, really excited to see how this works. Um, yes, thank you. So check that out. This is, in, this is going to open up in San Francisco. Um, so if you're interested, contact Gaver. All right, hacker spaces. 
Um, another great place for education. I love hackerspaces and what they do for education. Please bring kids to hackerspaces. I think the legal limit is like 14, because below that there are some like legality issues. They're semi-adults at that point, so high schoolers can go to hackerspaces. Um, unless uh, you're from NYCR, because they don't let kids. There's that weird rule. I love NYCR, but I don't know why they don't let kids in, because they do some really cool stuff. Um, there are a lot of things to be learned. Um, I took a bunch of uh, high school kids into um, an iron foundry recently to do a Christmas project. We built Santa's ultimate sleigh out of uh, steel. And they went and learned about welding and all the big tools that go on in a foundry. And they built things. It was really kind of neat. And then they saw their work displayed at the Craftsman store in downtown Chicago. So all right, another thing is play with your food. Play with fire. Um, you know, the whole thing about, uh, you know, what was the thing that, that Mota does? What gastro, get, molecular. Mo molecular gastronomy. Thank you. All right. I have, I'm having difficulty talking right now. Um, but molecular gastronomy, you know, the signs of food, play with it. See what you can make of that. Discover, like talk about the chemistry behind it. There's so much that can be learned with food. Um, I'm so frustrated with people saying, how is food related to math? And they say, oh, because you have to measure stuff. It has to do with like whole numbers and fractions. Boring. It also has to do with physics and chemistry, you know, how, how these things interact with each other. Um, there's so much stuff that's involved with making food. Um, OK, public spaces. Um, I just got a Kindle recently, and I think it's like the best thing ever because I can carry around like books that weigh three tons in this tiny little machine and that like flips pages. It's so cute. But I think the Kindle one of these days is going to make libraries in some ways obsolete. Not completely, because I still love books. But I think the need for libraries is going to shrink um, as we move into the future. And I think a great way to reinvent the public space of a library is um, to be creative and think of a way that we can all use that space together as a building space. This is the New York City Public Library. Look how huge it is. You know, to do a conference in there or to do a big build out. Um, you know, work with your uh, local community members and see what you can come up with. The library is part of the community. And if we are all reading electronically, we should be using that space to do things physically, too. All right, finally, teach, listen, and learn, work together. Woohoo! And if you have any questions, um, please contact me. Um, I can send you the slide deck, too. But I don't usually post up my slide decks because they're all pictures, more or less. I have like two slides with information on it. But any of the information that you got today, or if you have any additional information, I'd love to hear about it. There's no way I could hear about all of the different education programs going on in the world, or even in America. Um, but hopefully, with all of your help, um, we can get people to think about things in a broader scope sense. You know, that mathematics isn't about like filling in bubbles on a page or the right answer. It's about the process to get there. You know? So thank you very much. That's me. Um, do I have time for questions? Like five minutes? Questions, comments, heckling? Last year, there was, last year there was a fantastic talk about education uh, similar to what you gave. Uh, it was a parenting uh, geek kid, and they have the video of it on the Nauticon website. So you can watch the, that talk last year, and it was really good. It was along similar lines to yours. Okay, great. Thanks. I had a couple questions, actually. When you were comparing the, the Chinese and American teachers, I noticed that you had uh, 23 um, American yeah. teachers and 72 um, Chinese teachers. Is there a reason for that? I'm not discrepancy? exactly sure why she did that. Um, I think it was just the teachers who were willing to participate and the pool that she drew. This is from Leaping Ma's book. This wasn't my research. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. The other one is uh, I was just curious if you knew of any results from that uh, Math for America um, program. Um, Math for America hasn't released any statistics as far as like how its teachers are doing in comparison. Um, that's one of the things that worries me about the program, that it started out very promising. And right now, it's like the follow through is a little weak. I'm not seeing a lot of the statistics being published. And even though it's like branching out all over the place, they're not doing it in a cohesive manner. I think it's a little wishy-washy at this point. So I'm curious to see like how they get their act together. Yeah. If you find these statistics, that would be great. 
Um, yeah, the San Francisco Brightworks. Do you know if that's operating as a private school or a charter school or? It is operating as a charter school, but it doesn't, its kids do not take standardized exams. Um, and so that's going to be interesting. It is making connections with schools like Stanford and MIT. Like the top tier schools were really curious about how this like little experiment is going to work out. Obviously, there is no room for standardized tests in a, in a school like that. Um, so we'll have to see. It hasn't started yet. Um, so it's all promise now. Crossing my fingers. I had a question about the, the Teach for America program, largely because it seems to me that there might be kind of a blind spot in it based on the results of it that assumes that perforce people who have Ivy League educations are better than the rest of us. And, and from my own experience, I probably could have gotten into Harvard, but my parents couldn't afford to pay it. Mm -hmm. So that it just seems like there's a there's a, a kind of conceit there that that you know um, people who go to these certain institutions are definitely better than the rest of the population, and that doesn't seem like a necessarily valid mm -hmm. assumption mm -hmm. to me as as a scientist. And I was just wondering if you had any if you had done any research into that regarding um, why it is that the the performance of Teach for America is not that much better than the local teachers. Well, okay. In, in Teach for America's defense, um, it does take high-performing students from colleges around the country. I think it started out in the Ivy Leagues because the founder, Wendy Kopp, graduated from Princeton. So that was her initial sort of jump start. However, now Teach for America um, takes in about 8,000 students a year to become teachers from um, just top-performing students from all colleges, all four-year colleges from all around the country. Um, the, I think the biggest weakness that they have is the lack of preparation. Um, a true graduate program is one to two years. UTEP does two years, one year of just pure mathematics and one year of pure pedagogy. Um, and Math for America does one year mixed. Teach for America does six weeks. So they're assuming that you come in knowing mathematics, and they're assuming you come in knowing how to teach mathematics. And they throw people into the worst schools where there are huge management problems. A lot of these, these kids, they're really just kids. They're 22 coming out of college. They don't know how to manage 18-year-old kids. It's really difficult. And sometimes you're not dealing with 18-year-old kids. You're dealing with 18-year-old kids and the gang older brother who's convincing him to get a tattoo um, so that he can eventually join the gangs and go out and like shoot with him. Um, you know, as much as I love shooting, I don't want to like, <laughs> I don't want to do it for crack. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I've, I've seen kids who come with a huge, like, load on their shoulders just from their backgrounds. And, you know, I've seen, like, a lot of pregnant teenagers. There's a cool school that I work with. 10% of the high school girls are currently pregnant. You know, how do you deal with that and teach them math? Like, this isn't something that can be approached in a six-week program. So, unfortunately, you're talking about a program that's trying to accomplish more than it's able to do in the given time frame. They say there's also a lot of um, you know, support. There isn't a lot of support. Once a month, you get someone in from the college to come in and talk to you about your teaching and maybe give you a couple of pointers. That's not enough. Um, not unless you're ready to just kick ass. And every so often, Teach for America gets very lucky. Um, Wendy Kopp just actually published a new book about things she learned from Teach for America teachers. And there are some exceptional cases that she lists of people who just give up their lives. They work Saturdays. They call home. They wake up at 7 a.m. to call their kids to remind them to come to school. Um, they, they grade. They do extracurricular activities. They work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day, including Saturdays. And then Sundays are their grading days. Um, so for an entire year or two years, they give up their lives so that they can do a really good job. Are we supposed to say all teachers do that? Like, no teachers should have lives or families. This is all they should dedicate their lives for at, what, $30,000 a year. Um, so, Teach for America tries to accomplish a lot, and I admire them for that. However, they're not giving any of the support systems in place to make it happen. So, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, again, uh, really enjoyed the speech, but uh, I've got a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, 
one uh, touches on the the percentage of African American males uh, in in prisons versus graduating college. I am talking general. about African American males from inner city schools. Okay. So uh, right. like DC, Chicago, New York, Detroit. LA, <laughs> Detroit. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah. Um, so recently, I started teaching uh, after-school programs uh, in Ann Arbor, uh, Lego robotics and and just basic computing and introduction to programming. And um, you know, uh, I went to an all-boys Catholic school in in uh, Detroit, and there was uh, it was pretty much for uh, African American youth that were uh, po- had the possibility of straying. Um, and I think that it's a very big uh, cultural aspect of. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not cool uh, for you to be into computers. Um, you know, I was pretty much ridiculed for bringing my laptop to school, and yeah. and you know, I had a guy break my laptop. Uh, but uh, what can be done to really, really change that? When, when, because um, I, I have one student who at first was like, "No, I'd much rather be." You know, he didn't want to be there at all. His parents signed him up for the program, but over time of actually showing him, like, "Hey, dude, this is actually cool," and uh, giving them positive reinforcement, um, you know, uh, he started to get into it more. But I just find the general lack of that in in the uh, community, uh, even even in in the the uh, the hacker slash maker community. I, I don't necessarily think that there's enough outreach to um, you know uh, to that segment of the population. Yeah. Uh, and uh, is there is there a way to change that and um, counteract some of the images of, you know, hey, I want to, you know, drive in a Bentley and, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, be in a gang or whatnot. Is there a way to, to, to counteract that, that with, hey, I want to be a scientist or, you know. So I, I think, you know, what, what you talk about with um, how difficult it is to get African Americans into hacker spaces and into like things like science and computer science and technology. Um, a lot of minorities face it. You know, the same question can be brought up of of women. Um, why aren't there more women in the sciences? Why aren't there more women in hacker spaces? Right? How many people actually have a 50-50 uh, diversity of women in in their hacker space? Right? Um, I like I think 70-30 is like admirable. It's like woohoo! You got a, you got women's. Um, but <laughs> you know, like. But it's, you know, it's the same thing across the board. Like, I think it, you're absolutely right. It has to do with culture. Um, I was just talking to the founder of um, urban prep schools in Chicago. Um, again, a lot of my, my knowledge is Chicago-based, so I'm sorry if, you know. Um, but this guy is very interesting. He opened up a school that was exclusively for Chicago public school males. Um, they come into the high school at the ninth grade level, and... Um, He's graduated at this point two full classes, and every single class of those has had 100% admission acceptance rate into four-year colleges. Um, compared with a Chicago average of, um, I think it's one out of every 40 gets uh, gets to graduate from college. He's on track to getting, you know, one out of two, or you know, even higher to graduate because he's getting. Uh, in, in these schools, 100% of the students get in, 90% of the students go, and I'm really curious to see how many of the students stay because they even, you know, the whole community is into this. They have longer school days. They communicate with their families. They convince them that this path to making a better future for you and your community, being the black community, is to make sure that you go to college. Does everyone need to go to college? No. But does every single African American in this school have to go to college? Absolutely, because you represent the future. So that's the idea that's thrown out there. There are kids there who told me they're going to be um, engineers in the future. You know, there are people who tell me I want to be a bone doctor because I thought it was really fascinating how the x-rays worked when I broke my arm. Like kids who think in a different way. So, you know, it, it's possible, but it, it, it takes a lot of work to build that community. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. 